Yankees Bubbler Tour on ESPN is being brought to you by True Value Hardware. For quality, selection, and personal attention, make True Value Hardware your store of first choice. By Fairlanes, the fun lanes. Join a Fairlanes League today. By Roberta Dorn, the official makeup artist of the Ladies Pro Bowler Tour. And by Sue B. Honey, purity you can taste. And welcome everyone to Fairlane Southway in Houston, Texas for the championship round finals of the $40,000 Lady Fairlanes Open. And now let's meet tonight's top five finalists starting from the number five position and looking for her seventh career championship. It's WIBC Hall of Famer Judy Sutar. Her opponent in the opening chess is a talented 20-year-old right-hander, Wendy McPherson of San Diego, California. The survivor of that opening game will then face off against 12-time titleist Cindy Coburn out of Buffalo, New York. And with 14 career titles already to her credit, 26-year-old Alita Sill will start this evening from the runner-up position. While the tour's leading money winner, Lisa Wagner, will need to win just one game in order to claim her sixth LPBT championship of the year and draw within $1,500 of the $100,000 barrier. Hi, everybody. I'm Denny Schreiner, and welcome to hot and humid Houston, Texas. Fairlane Southway Bowling Center working with me once again, Leila Wagner, who finished up this week in the number 12 position, was fifth at one time. It slipped down a little bit at the end. Nevertheless, once again, though, Leila, the main question, I guess the lead paragraph and the title to Mrs. Wagner, she finished at the head of the class once again this week. She did, Denny. Dominating once again in 1988. We see Lisa Wagner coming in 3-0 and from that number one position. Uh, she has a lot of confidence from that position and on the season 12 and 3 on national television for Lisa Wagner but if Cindy Coburn or perhaps an Alita Sill gets to the championship game both tested players it won't be an easy victory for Lisa here tonight no it won't uh, Cindy Coburn has 12 titles to her credit Alita Sill 14 uh, both those players do know how to shoot for the money all right Leila you have spent many years on the road with Lisa Wagner watching her bowl and bowling against her is she beginning to feel the pressure of trying to become the first woman to win 100 thousand dollars in a season you know Denny I really think Lisa is feeling the pressure here we haven't seen her win in the fall however she's done well we just haven't seen her come out and really dominate like we saw her do earlier in the season I would say yes the pressure's on her well she took over the lead after the 42nd game here last night and she'll bowl for seven thousand dollars a little later this evening but before we get to the championship game a very talented duo in the opener Judy Sutar and Wendy McPherson See Judy back, huh? Oh, I tell you, she finished third earlier this season with Lisa Wagner in the doubles, and uh, she doesn't make too many telecasts, and she was real excited this week uh, to be up there consistently. She was in second after the first round and just stayed right there up in the top five. Well, Julie's, or Judy, I should say, has been bowling professionally almost 30 years. Wendy McPherson is only 20 years old, a very talented player, and she opens up with a strike against her counterpart. Judy definitely has her... Um, work cut out for here up against Wendy McPherson. Uh, Wendy we saw win earlier this year in the Queens tournament and uh, you know but Judy has a lot of experience. If she can just settle down a little, take her time, I think she'll do fine. Judy averaged 214.5 on the championship pair here this week. Lanes 15 and 16. And uh, I mentioned she started with a 140 game last night but uh, seasoned vet she bounced right back and bowled just super the rest of the evening. Lots of loft for the opening shot. Pretty good opening offering and leaves the 10 pin. <sighs> she comes back shaking her hand there. Uh, she just smiled. <laughs> Judy doesn't usually loft the ball out there. She's looking down, feeling her thumb. Uh, I think the perspiration uh, had a ten tendency to stick here. You know, the hot, humid weather we were talking about earlier, Denny. Uh, it gets to you when you ball. Boy, it's the fall, and uh, it was... Uh well into the 80s today, lots of humidity, a couple of thunderstorms in the Houston area, so you're right, the humidity is very high, and that's going to change uh, the size of the thumb throughout the match in the opening game here, and obviously through the other games tonight. Going to have to slide a little bit, and so Judy, with a uh, miscue in the opening frame, gives an opportunity to Wendy McPherson very quickly. 
something we don't see Judy Sutar do very often, miss spares, special single pin spares. Again, she did not clear the thumb hole there as the ball just lost off her hand, not hitting her target. Hardest thing in the world to do, Leila, is when you're fighting that thumb hole a little bit, you just don't get out of the ball very clean. No, you don't. Uh, you know, it's essential that you get out of the thumb hole quickly and your fingers rotate your ball. If you get every out at the same time, you're pretty much history. <laughs> Or if the thumb hangs up, let's see. That one, she drops. Going to have to skid a little bit. It's through the nose. So right now, Judy Sutar not only fighting lanes 15 and 16, but the grip on the bowling ball as well. Do you know, Leila, if this is a ball she had drilled up for the show, or is this one she played with most of the week? Oh, no. This is one uh, I'm sure she played with most of the week. She did have a little problem in the morning blocks, never really um, shooting real good, um, or as well as she did towards the evening blocks when the lanes seem to hook a little bit more. Uh, Judy is not the type of player that comes out here and drills bowling balls. You know, she's from the old school. You move your feet. You don't necessarily switch balls. And uh, it's it's real tough for her to um, just come in and drill a ball. She likes to be comfortable with that ball. Not sure if she was going to cover that there. She uh, gives a little smile saying, uh, thank you. <laughs> and of course, uh the steady nerves of 20-year-old Wendy McPherson, already with three career championships. In 1988, she captured the WIBC Queens event. So she's already won one time this year, a very uh, capable player. Oh, she is. Uh, she's, Wendy's uh, done well in all her television appearances. So we saw Judy uh, working out her thumb hole, making sure she gets a good feel for the next shot. And uh, Wendy comes back with a nice double there. Judy definitely uh, trying to get a good feel. Wendy hit for a light here, Denny. Uh, as you can see, the ball just skidding, not quite getting into that roll. What we call a wall shot. <laughs> Five pins uh, basically on the deck. It's her seventh championship round appearance. Once again, not quite getting up to the head pin. The lanes appear to be uh, quite a bit tighter uh, for the telecast this evening than they have been during the week. Uh, our lane conditioner builds up daily, and uh, by the time the te television show comes along, it seems that uh, there's quite a bit, quite a bit more uh, lane conditioner on than during the week. Okay, so what do you do when the lanes tighten up? Well, you obviously have to move right and, uh, and or go to uh, a softer shell bowling ball. Converts the 2-5, and it wasn't easy. And so it's a 19-pin advantage thus far in the early stages of match number one for Wendy McPherson. Judy Sutar trailing by 19. That's the look that has got her seven professional titles. Ooh. You know, Denny, she just is not clearing her thumb at all. Judy basically going straight up towards the pocket, trying to right go over the second arrow, and that one she had inside her target, leaving her with a terrible split. She knew this. <laughs> Uh-oh. But you can feel it when you don't release it right. And this is a prime example, and she almost got that. Second open now out of three frames, and for Judy Sutar, she has dug herself a very deep hole here in the early stages of this one, now trailing by 33 pins. And so at this point in time, uh, going to have to start throwing some strikes. There's nothing like giving your opponent the advantage while sitting on the bench. Taking a little extra time with this shot. Obviously realizing there's no time like the present to get started. That was a much better shot. Oh, and she leaves herself with a 10 pin as it just waddled. She got out of that ball very uh, clean. Trying to make the adjustment at this point, get a little better feel with the shot. 
needs to kind of regroup a little bit. And uh, showing some experience now, Judy taking a little extra time to make sure that she doesn't miss another 10 pin. She missed one in the first frame, however, it was on lane 16. Well, Judy's last title was in 1977, Denny, and uh, I know her, and I know she's feeling the pressure of uh, the television. Kind of dropped that one as well. So Judy Sutar right now uh, having problems with lanes 15 and 16. However, Wendy McPherson feeling any control at this point. We'll be back with more right after this. This. And while we were away, Wendy McPherson with a solid strike in the fourth on the right-hand lane, looking to really put the clamps on at this stage. At the midway mark kind of stood up on that shot through the nose and leaves the 6-10, but uh, she's got to be feeling pretty comfortable at this point in time with a 44-pin advantage. She definitely has to be feeling comfortable. However, you know, when the momentum of the match is low, like where Judy comes in, misses a couple spares, and leaves a split, it slows the pace down, and this in turn can cause Wendy to get a little off. And, uh, you know, she has to keep her momentum up. That's why a lot of times when you see matches going really good, both players are bowling really well. Wendy McPherson averaging 222 on lanes 15 and 16 throughout the week here. And, uh, Judy Sutar will have to call on uh, all of the resources of better than 29 years of bowling professionally to try and pull this match out. She's a never-say-die player, but uh, has really struggled here this evening. Bit of a tentative shot that time on the right-hand lane, and I guess that's about what happens to you. After a while, you realize that you don't have the right ball in the right field. Get a good look at Judy's game. Judy opens her shoulder. This is where she gets her power. She's very small and uh, an old type style. There's her leverage, knee bend, as she uh, straightens up pretty quickly. She really doesn't stay down too long, and uh, she's a spinner, as we call She does spin the ball. But this is her style, and it's been uh, successful for her for the 28 years she's been out here on the tour. And you see a big smile. I have a mark. <laughs> Nearly a chop of the six off the ten, and uh, trying to save Grace at this point. Uh, her husband, Dave Sutar, uh, bowling in Rochester, New York, where the PBA opens up this week. It's a fall tour, and I know David was an A-squad player, so I'm sure that he's watching this one this evening, probably from the hotel room, and uh, if you've got any words of advice, David, now's the time to speak up. <laughs> well, Dave has been bowling uh, great um, last year. He's just really back in tune. Needs a little help and swishes the rack on the left-hand lane, gives herself a little pat on the back, so Judy Sutar finally strikes in the sixth. Well, I don't think Wendy's really feeling the pressure from that strike, Denny. She did strike last time on lane 16. She just really, once again, has to keep her momentum up and uh, not make any crucial errors at this point. You see that oil carry down, and obviously this lane's a little tighter than they have been throughout the week. We're going to see a few half tens there this evening. I think so. Uh, if you move a little bit farther to the right, the ball has a tendency to hook a little bit on you and uh, get you in trouble, or you might not get it up there to the pocket. So uh, the girls are going very straight towards the pocket. Looks like Wendy went right over the second arrow, and uh, the ball not finishing quite hard enough to get the ten. Look at Wendy's game here. Very basic. Four-step approach. Pushes the ball away. She really gets... This is where her knees are low. She gets the leverage here. A strong, strong player. Well, I like the way she gets the ball into the swing very quickly and just kind of lets it swing, and then the feet gather the momentum. She gets the ball very short as well, Denny. This one closes in on the pocket a little bit high, and so Wendy McPherson now through seven frames leads by 43, and she's hoping to advance into game number two. We'll be back with the conclusion of the opener right after this. The front side not too successful, but uh, 
on the home holes. Judy Sutar bowling much better. She struck while we were away. Oh, that would have closed it to 23 pins, but uh, leaves the soft 10 on lane 15. And uh, I think you're right, Leila Wagner. Right now, Judy would probably say, okay, I'm warmed up, ready to go. Line up, let's start the match over. Danny, her last three shots uh, were super. She swishes the five in the sixth and the seventh. She just 10 in the pit and in the eighth. The 10 could have gone, you know. I guess she would really like to uh, start over here five frames after the fact. Boy, how tough it is. The game just flies by, and you know that probably better than anybody else. You've been out there yourself. <gasps> oh, it does. If Judy would have carried that one there, Denny, she would have had a chance. She would have uh, continued to strike through the match to force Wendy to catch a double. Well, she's had problems with a 10-pin this evening. She missed one in the first and has barely uh, nicked a couple others. She is saving the wood for Wendy McPherson, who's been knocking it down here this evening. Of course, the winner of this game uh, will then match up with 31-year-old Cindy Coburn, Alita Sill, qualifying number two, and uh, the player of the year thus far, Lisa Wagner, in the number one slot here tonight. Double up, this one a little high, and uh, Wendy McPherson isn't exactly lined up uh, on the championship, apparently, Isla. No, she isn't, uh, especially here on lane 16, Denny. Uh, she's gone high the last two shots. She, no, she left the half 10 on 16 last time, so she was making the adjustment here for the half 10, and uh, the ball went through the nose, so uh, she's not really lined up. We'll have to see how Cindy Coburn comes out. And, oh! So, uh, the first open of the match for Wendy McPherson, an unforced error as she misses the 6-10. So now her best possible score, 215. She's right now bowling at a 195 clip. And if Judy Sutar would strike out, she could shoot 193. So it's a 22-pin lead, and that's been cut in half in the last two frames. Oh, that's right. Uh, when you're down by 44 pins, when you're Judy Sutar in the fifth frame, you better keep on uh, striking or stay close. Good shot that time, at a little high, does not trip the four. And it's amazing how these matches turn around so quickly. If she converts the four and strikes out, Wendy could shoot 205, which is obviously more than enough to advance into game number two. But it'd uh, be interesting to see if Judy Sutar could strike out and put a little heat on her, what might happen. If Judy gets up and strikes out, Denny, she forces Wendy to mark. And we've seen stranger things happen in the past. So, well, sometimes uh, it's harder to get a mark than it is to get a strike in some cases. Terrific crowds all week long. As a matter of fact, uh, this capacity crowd showed up a couple of hours early here this evening to get the best possible seats. So the ladies' pro bowlers tour well received in the uh, greater Houston area. Betty Morris was the winner here last year. Betty made the finals here this week, but uh, didn't quite get to the telecast. Judy Sutar needs to strike desperately, and once again, the old pro comes back. Well, that's the Hall of Famer showing up uh, right there. Here's a shot of her arm opening up, and this is Judy's uh, style right there, right up the second arrow, and she just swishes the five. And she'll show you a little of emotion. <laughs> Not much, but a little. Yeah. I think that's about the extent of it right there. <laughs> I've right. seen her slap her hands a couple times. Pressure shot now in the 10th for Judy Sutar, trying to stay alive in the opening game. Oh, Danny, that was uh, about the best shot uh, here of the match. Now she trails by just 12. Could cut the lead to two if she strikes here. And uh, I think you're right. Your perception's right on the money there. That was probably the best shot. And, of course, in the toughest situation, how many times do you see the pros rise to the occasion and come up with that little extra shot when they need it? Judy knows exactly what she has to do in this situation. Well, I watched her last night in match play in a couple of crucial situations. Really slowed herself down, took a couple of deep breaths, and brought the, the heart rate right back down. And said, okay, let's just take it one shot at a time. She has bounced back here, and now with a possible strike, a 193, and that's going to force Wendy McPherson to at least mark in the 10th. Once again, another super shot. 
just like the first one in the tent, packed. Denny, she needs to get good count here. If she gets good count here, she forces Wendy actually to get good count on the first shot. So any buckets or any type of situation like that, Wendy could lose the match even if she spared him. out in the ninth and the tenth and so nine or better on the opening shot for Wendy McPherson or there could be some problems I tell you Denny three just superb shots right in a row well whatever David told her she must have listened <laughs> now pressure swings back to 20 year old Wendy McPherson doesn't waste any time oh my Excellent shot delivered that time by McPherson. And, uh, of course, her first title was the U.S. Open. And uh, you don't win the U.S. Open without making great clutch shots. No, and uh, this was a clutch shot since she hadn't really been lined up here on lane 16. She just uh, threw that one right up, almost what we call a tightrope in it. And Judy Sutar with a terrific finish, but... Uh, Unfazed youngster here needs nine on two balls, and she says, the heck with that, I'll just strike in the 11. And Judy Sutar, with a gallant effort here this evening in Houston, is going to come up with too little too late. Well, Judy always loved bowling here in Houston. Denny, she uh, won the Queens and the WIBC All Events and the WIBC team back in 1974. And... Uh, I know she's going to be feeling those two 10 pins that she missed earlier in the match. And being a roommate uh, this week, I'm going to hear a little bit about it, I'm sure. Well, you miss spares on national television. You're going to finish second. Striking out terrific clutch performance by both Judy Sutar and Wendy McPherson. So for Judy, it's $1,800 and a five-place finish. Mopping her brow is Wendy McPherson. She'll move on now to take on Cindy Coburn when we return. Jairo Garcia, district manager for Fair Lanes, uh, a beautiful trophy and a nice check. An excellent pro-am here, over 600 uh, amateurs bowling with the professionals, so it was a very successful week. That it was. I was bowling until 1.30 in the morning. And Ted Gloff, the special events manager for Coors Light and Glenda Millar for Houston uh, Bowlers Victory Legion Fund. And they raised well over $2,000 for the Bowlers Victory Legion, which has to do with the Veterans Hospital in the local area. And uh, I had the opportunity to visit there Friday and meet some of the great uh, guys out there at the Veterans Hospital. They had a nice bowling facility, and uh, you know it's really inspirational to go see them. Well, it's a uh, terrific charity and has done a lot of good through the years for our veterans. Cindy Coburn and Wendy McPherson in game number two here as uh, they get the nod for the handshake, but uh, enough of that sportsmanship now. It's time to get down to business. Wendy McPherson defeating Judy Sutar in the opening game, 205 to 193, and after leading by 44 pins at one point, and to throw a strike in the 10th to ice the match. Here we go, first shot, game number two. Picking up right where she left off, and uh, it appears that she's making the minor adjustments on the championship pair. Well, as the uh, bowling continues, Denny, the lanes do change a bit. Uh, like we mentioned before, the lane conditioner carries down, and uh, the adjustments are subtle, but they are there. Two, four, five stands for Cindy Coburn, and uh, it's not an easy way to open up the match. No, it's not. Um, you're expecting the lanes to uh, move a little bit more than they did. That particular shot uh, didn't make it back up to the head pin, so Cindy has just found out that the conditioner has carried down from the time she practiced on him. lane at the 2-4-5 and chopping it off. The two and the four go, but the five stands. So both of her first two opponents have opened up against Wendy McPherson. 
Cindy has a very nice game. Five-step approach, pushes the ball way out in front of her. Here she is, once again, very low. A lot of the women professionals get most of their leverage and their power from their legs. And as she stays very low at the line, that's where she gets through, through the ball. The player you hear practicing in the background is Alita Sill, who qualified number two. Cindy trying to get something started and a very good shot on the left-hand lane, but after the open, Wendy McPherson had to like that. Once again, sitting on the bench, Wendy McPherson gets the lead, and uh, that's the way to do it. What's that do for you mentally? Does it pump you up when your opponent makes a mistake? Sure, Denny. With only 10 frames to bowl in a, a match, you know, they, they do go by fast, and if your opponent gives you an opening early, it tends to uh, settle you down a little bit. Terrible break there for Wendy, Denny. She just uh, swished that five in front of the seven. Look at her eyes, too. She's saying to herself, there's not a chance in the world that seven pin can stand. You bet. Watch this five pin. Watch all the pins. The five went right in front of the seven. The head of the five pin even touched it, and that seven was just uh, wobbling and did not fall. A lot of fingers in that ball. So it could have been a double, but as it stands right now, she leads by 11. It's those little breaks early in a match that can really make the difference. There's uh, Nick Papanis, I believe, uh, Wendy's fiance. And earlier this year, we uh, mentioned they were getting married in February. Well, that date has changed. It's now March 11th because uh, we will be bowling in February. So uh, they have worked their schedule around the bowling tour. Well, work comes first, huh? Oh, yeah. Got to pay the bills. That's right. Nick will be traveling with Wendy as well uh, for the nine-week swings that we get into next year. So keep her company. Leaves the 2-5, and uh, are my eyes deceiving me, Leila, or is this pair even getting tighter and tighter as uh, game number two wears on? What are they going to have to do to try and compensate for that? Well, Denny, once again, they're going to have to continue moving right. If you are missing to the right, you want to move your feet farther right and play more of an angle to the pocket. Do you move your bark, in other words, too, or no? Yes, you would want to move your... Uh, well, you kind of play with it, Benny. At first, you're going to start moving your feet a little bit, maybe leave your mark in the same spot, and then uh, eventually keep adjusting. Move two and one to the right, two boards to uh, one board out on the lanes to create more of that angle. slower speed this time leaves the four that's one thing we haven't yet touched on uh, what about speed control I know it's dangerous to get a little slow because the ball might overreact but uh, that's obviously an alternative I think speed control this week was uh, definitely a factor in uh, the play here it was pretty easy to get to the pocket the scores were were really high this week and uh, it was speed if you had the right speed you carried Cross lane at the four, no problem there for Cindy Coburn, already with 12 titles in her career. She's already won once here in 1988 and finished fourth three different times, so she's been in the hunt, but she hasn't been able to become a multiple champion this year. No, and her uh, title that she did win was with Bonnie Joel in the doubles, Denny, so in a singles event, her highest finish is fourth. You know, we were mentioning speed control, Denny. For an amateur, it's a little bit uh, more difficult to adjust the speed on the ball. So usually they need to adjust on the lane and on the approach. Well, she struck the last time. This time sails by the 2-4-5 once again. And I can tell you this from experience. It's no fun to shoot the bucket or the 2-4-5 more than once a game. Well, Cindy, we saw her chop the spare in the first frame. And uh, we'll see her make the adjustment here in the fourth. Chopped it the last time, gives it a little more room this time, and the four pin sticks around. So another mistake for Coburn. We'll be back with more right after this. Shut! 
shot, Jeannie. Nice shot, Walter Ray. Jeannie Maiden and Walter Ray Williams are proud to introduce the Ebonite Gyro One Blue Gray and the Lady Ebonite. 100% urethane, priced much less than most urethane balls. High performance at a great value. You can't buy a better ball at a better price, right, Walter Ray? Right, Jeannie. The Gyro One Blue Gray and the Lady Ebonite. Pure power, strike after strike after strike. Back at Fairlane Southway in Houston, Texas, Denny Schreiner along with Leila Wagner, and in the fourth, a strike by uh, Wendy McPherson. And of course, this is a uh, first shot in the fifth through the nose. A little adjustment there, not an easy spare. That's going to have to hurry. And oh, oh off the back off curtain. The, wall. the biggest break of the evening thus far for a very surprised Wendy McPherson. <laughs> yes, she was surprised on that. I think we were too, uh, Denny. That pin came out of the curtain and uh, managed to hit the nine. You saw the look on Cindy Coburn's face, uh, disbelief as well. She's saying, now wait a minute, I knew she missed that thing. What happened? <laughs> Cindy with two opens already on the 2-4-5. Needs to start striking as soon as possible. And now the bucket stands. So let me ask you this, Leila. It's fifth frame. She's thrown one strike. Obviously, the ball's not working very well. Is it time to go to the arsenal and pull something else out? Well, at this point, yes, if she wants to um, stay within this match. But she did throw the strike. She threw a four-pin previously on this particular lane she knows she can hit the pocket with this ball and i think that that's the problem in her mind she's going well if i would have totally missed for four frames you know i may need to switch but uh, if she can't get there consistently you have to open up your strike pocket in your area and uh, right now she's not doing that with this particular ball so, uh, cindy told me throughout the week she did throw that ball most of the time felt very comfortable with it like the reaction so i guess it's like the old adage you know you don't want to change something that's been working uh, even though at this point in time she now trails by 23. i have a lot of problem doing that denny i feel comfortable with the ball i i feel that it's you know me as long as i know i can strike with it then i try to make the adjustments and and not necessarily switch equipment and uh the better players, I think, uh, switch a little quicker. Well, she bounces right back, though, and throws a perfect shot. And, of course, we're assuming, Leila, that she's throwing the ball well. She might not have thrown as many good shots as we think. That one was. Well, this is a prime example of why she wants to stay <laughs> with this ball. Uh, she knows her. she can hit the pocket with it, and uh, she just executed very well on that shot. And I think that's where you know in your mind, hey, if I'm executing right and the ball's not cooperating or doing what I think it should do, then it's time to switch. But if you're executing good, you stay with it. The right-hand lane, lane 16, has been the better of the two thus far this evening for Wendy McPherson. And so she strikes now in the sixth. And uh, with a double here in the seventh, would increase the lead to 33. Alita Sill waiting in the wings. And then, of course, uh, on top of the uh, field of 98 players that started this week, Lisa Wagner. <laughs> Trying to open up a little room, and she does with an excellent shot. So it's now 33 pins the lead for Wendy McPherson. And we'll be back with the conclusion of game number two after this timeout. While we were away, uh, an excellent double by Cindy Coburn. She jumped back in the match. Well, we just saw her throw three uh, super shots. Both uh, Wendy's opponents here have started their matches in the sixth frame. Better late than never, but against McPherson, that's not the easiest way to go, as this time she flags the head pin and was very fortunate to leave just the one-two. A lot of washouts uh, this week, Denny. If you sent the ball right, uh, that's what you left. It's very difficult when your target is left of uh, your body or your arm swing, in this case for Wendy. Uh, she doesn't feel real comfortable doing that. She does do it well, but uh, when it is that case, occasionally when you relax or you just get up there a little bit fast, you miss the head pin. Well, I think, too, if you look at Wendy's game, she has a tendency to be an inside-out player. She'll wrap the ball around her back a little bit, and it's tough, as you said, when, when you can't throw the ball to the right, when you've got to go straight with the boards, it's more difficult to make that adjustment. She leads by 11, but uh, Cindy Coburn has really 
actually closed the gap and has a possible 225. So the heat's still on Wendy McPherson here in game number two. Well, this is also why Denny, uh, she does go through the beak a couple times because she's trying to overcompensate for that in-to-out swing. No question. It's tough, tough to get lined up. Boy, nice shot there. You'll see her make some great shots, but it is tough to kind of realign your swing in the heat of battle, but that's what she's done. She has a possible 226, so, oh, my. Here you see a good shot of her swing there. This ball, she managed to get out a little bit, and it did come back. with that one a touch too long and knew it as soon as she let it go so Coburn leaves the bucket and 225 is no longer a possibility she'll have her hands full trying to spare here in the ninth Cindy mentioned to me earlier Denny she had been having equipment problems for about a year now and uh, recently she just uh, switched a lot in her spans and her pitches and things like that and it's taken her about three or four weeks here to really get comfortable with it uh, she hasn't bowled as well as we're used to seeing Cindy Coburn bowl in the fall and uh, she bowled real well this week well she sets very high standards for herself as she now chops the bucket leaves the five and the door swings wide open her best score now if she strikes out it's 189 not something you see uh, consistently by professionals to meet, miss the same spare, but it's a professional's nightmare. She's missed it uh, two different ways, and, uh, you know, she's making the adjustments. You can see that, but uh, you just go, well, what am I going to do now? Wendy McPherson has been the fortunate one thus far here this evening. Judy Sutar struggled early and then charged at the end, but it wasn't quite enough, and Cindy Coburn put a lot of pressure on her in the middle and the late stages of this game, only to open up in the ninth frame, and now her best possible score is 179, and Wendy McPherson is going to advance into uh, game number three here this evening in Houston, Texas, and uh, she has a history of kind of climbing the ladder when she won her first title of the U.S. Open. She won five matches in order to do so. Wendy had a great match play record there. We, she hadn't lost a match in, in a year, two years out on tour on television, so I don't know if they just hand her to him, and plus she does, you know, get up and in pressure situations, she makes the great shots. Well, and, uh, through the years, and talking to some of the great ones like Anthony and Roth and Holman, and of course, Lori Nichols and on the women's tour, players like Cindy Coburn, Lisa Wagner, they'll tell you, it runs in stages and in streaks, and Wendy won her first ten matches on national television, then lost the next three until she broke that string this evening against Sutar, so maybe she's back on the other side of the scale here tonight. So far, it appears that way. So Coburn tries to finish it out and does so nicely with a strike. 179, not the kind of game that Cindy Coburn was hoping to post here in Houston tonight. So she'll finish up in the number four slot here this evening and uh, take a check worth $2,000 right on down the road to uh, DeSoto, Texas to play next week on the LPBT Tour. Well, we've seen many times before, Danny, when a player is um, not given two matches, but their opponents open up early in a couple matches, they tend to go all the way. So uh, we'll have to see if Wendy can take on Alita. Leaves the baby split, but it's all academic at this stage. Alita Sill next in line, 26-year-old left-hander out of Dearborn, Michigan. And then in the number one position this week, it's 27-year-old Lisa Wagner of Palmetto, Florida. Trying to become the first woman ever to win $100,000 in a season. And she is closing in on that magic figure very quickly. Conversion of the baby split. Cindy a little disappointed, but uh, she'll have to take fourth place. So we'll be back with uh, the start of the semifinal game here from Fairlane Southway in just a moment or so. Alita Sill. There's Jeannie Maiden finishing up 10th this week after her first two wins. That's right, trying to win three in a row. Uh, the other Wagner finishing 12th, not bad. Not bad. Cheryl Robinson out on tour, finished great 17th. Betty Morris up in 20th there. Defending champion. And uh, Dee Dee Davidson, who's had a very nice fall, 32nd this week. And Vicki Fischel picking up the very last check. And speaking of money, well, these two right now are in the money and looking perhaps at heading on to the title match against Lisa Wagner. Alita Sill on your left. Wendy McPherson with already two victories notched here this evening. Starts the semifinal game on the left-hand lane. Wendy really hasn't pulled just great scores, Denny, a 204 and a 205, but it was good enough to win the first two matches. 
solid four pin stands and uh, she is a player that wastes very little time I like that that's right we shot we saw her need to get up and at least get nine pins in the first match she picked up her ball and uh, pretty much went <laughs> average 222 on the championship pair this week match play record of 12 wins and 12 losses Kind of tough to get there when you're 500. You know, I was noticing uh, a lot of the television finalists this week, uh, their match play record was quite low. Lisa Wagner's was 13 and 11, and Lita Sill had the highest with 16 and 8, and uh, the other players were 12, 14, and 15 wins. These are pretty low for uh, what we normally see. We usually see 18s, 17, 16 wins. I think it's indicative of the strength of the field, too. It's not easy to win matches. Opening offering for Alita Sill, who swishes the rack around a little bit. And what a show she put on earlier this fall when she started with the first nine. Oh, didn't she, Denny? And this was uh, how she did it right here. She started out with the first nine. Alita, once again, low at the line, really coming through the ball solid right there. The one thing that strikes me about her game is the fact that she does not have a, a straight left arm as she starts to come through the ball. It's bowed a little bit, almost uh, a la Amleto Monticelli. Not quite getting the revolutions that Mon Amleto Monticelli gets, yeah, however, but, uh, but gets the, the results. <laughs> the results are the same. We mentioned she started with nine in a row then at the AMF Virginia Classic in Virginia Beach, and she went on to lose the match 279 to 276 to Leanne Barrett at one of the wildest finishes ever in LPBT history. Now let's take a look. Look at that bent elbow, huh? Almost like uh, Miller Barber. <laughs> Yes, not quite uh, straight as we usually see them. Now both players uh, opening up with strong shots here. You know, that it, looking back at that freeze frame of Alita Sill kind of reminds me a little of Johnny Petraglia's backswing. You know, Rags with that little bent elbow there. And boy, what great results he's had through the years. That's true. I recently did a grand opening with Johnny Petraglia up at uh, Country Club Lanes where we were just a few weeks ago. And... I do recall that. You're right. See, these players are really before my time, Denny. That's right. <laughs> it's, it's amazing that you're still in junior high school and your mom's let you come out to play on the tour. That's right. Ah, a little swisher now. And boy, oh boy, these two players going at each other as we're evened up here in game number three. Well, it's taken the ladies a little while to get started, but now that they have, uh, we're seeing strikes all over the place. Once again, when the momentum gets going, Denny, you're pretty much answering to your opponent. loss to Alita in Virginia Beach and uh, I think she's determined not to let that happen again. Well, what she's saying to herself, uh, I have to shoot 300 to win on national television? <laughs> That's really amazing. What a thrilling match that was. One that uh, obviously we'll never forget. One of the highlights of the LPBT tour on ESPN here in the fall tour of 1988 and uh, now we're in the fourth. It looked like it was going to hit it again. She's like, look at her eyes. They were so wide. She just packed that one, Denny. I mean, that was Jam City on the left-hand lane. What went wrong? For a left-hander to leave a pack eight, watch this ball just dive. And that uh, head pin came flying off the wall right in front of it. And if looks could kill, guess what? <laughs> that pin would be dead and gone. Well, a perfect shot by Alita Sill, and she leads by nine here in the semifinal game. We'll be right back. Live action now in the fifth after uh, missing the 4-5-8 split in the fourth. A tough break as the two toppled. Now the swishing of the rack and... Uh, once again, uh, the eight pin stands, and uh, we didn't get a chance to see that shot in the fourth, but the bucket caved in a little bit. The two pin fell, and so she had to try and fit the glove in there for the four, five, eight, and couldn't quite do it. Oh, what a bad break to have the two pin uh, fall out of the bucket, Denny. Well, Lee DeSil hasn't exactly had too many good breaks lately on national television, so once in a while, you got to get some help. So a spare up in the fifth, and uh, this one's swinging around considerably in the favor of the lady in blue right now. She leads by 24. Well, we mentioned before, Alita with 14 pro titles. She can uh, throw strikes when she needs to. 
That's an understatement. Right back at him. Flush City on lane 16, and she has thrown five very professional shots. Once again, the bent elbow here, getting to the line. She's just so solid at the line tonight, you know, not raising up, staying down with the shot, and that's the key to making good shots. Right there, she uh, threw a good shot. She got the trip off the sixth, though. The ball coming in a little bit higher than uh, before. I think the speed was a little slower, and uh, there the sixth one went. Eight pin fell, so did the sixth, and there's the victory grasp right there. Big double for Alita Sill, who has extended the lead to 34. It's time for an X. McPherson. Oh, oh another tough break as the seven pin a couple of times for Wendy McPherson. It's just been very stubborn out there this evening. That seven pin, uh, we've seen her leave twice on lane 16, uh, almost the same way previously. Wendy McPherson, a player who knows how to string strikes in round number three here, the third round of qualifying, she shot 279, 279, 278. Just exploded. Now she's got some problems, though, on the right-hand lane as she misses the single pin spare, perhaps feeling the pressure of Alita Sills' lead. And right now... She's in big trouble. Nick wasn't looking too happy there with that uh, spare effort. As uh, there is quite a bit of conditioner in the center of the lane. She wanted to make sure she got it to the left, and uh, she just pulled a little too far. Nice free swing there. Unfortunately, it's a half pocket hit. Six pin a little lazy that time, and so she leaves the half ten. And uh, Lita Sill uh, poised and ready to wrap up this semifinal game and then perhaps take on the tour's leading money winner, Lisa Wagner, for the championship. Denny, that last shot Wendy threw was a prime example of when you do get your swing loose and you don't have that area to the right, you just don't get the ball to finish. So that's why she's been, once again, pulling the ball up to the pocket. Looked like a good shot, but you're right. Ten pins stood, so she's got some problems, but not that lady. We'll be back with a conclusion. In the pizza. And the striking machine uh, continued in the seventh. Uh, however, in the eighth frame, a little through-the-nose type of shot, and she was fortunate to leave the seventh pin well out in front of the semifinal game. Alita Sill with a spare up in the eighth, and uh, for Wendy McPherson possible 213 and that's if she just takes this one right off the sheet from the eighth frame. Alita looking uh, obviously the stronger of the two here Wendy really not having too much of a, a chance left in this match and I think she knows that she pretty much just got up and threw that ball. Leaving the washout on the right hand lane obviously didn't have the Greatest entry to the pocket this evening, but a gutsy performance on her part, winning two games. Uh, hey, you got to give her some credit for that. Oh, you bet. Uh, after the first round, Wendy was in 28th position and then made her move and um, qualified third and just went back and forth from third to fourth as she uh, tries there to pick up the washout. Trying to pretty much finish this one up after uh, defeating Judy Sutar 205 to 193 in the opening game. Then she locked horns with Cindy Coburn and again one with a 204-179 game, but uh, it's not to be here in the semifinal. We will have uh, the two women that have set the single season earnings records uh, in the past on the LPBT Tour going at each other in the championship game. Good shot there by Wendy McPherson in the ninth because Alita Sill just a few years ago won better than 80,000. She had the existing record, but Lisa Wagner has already broken that one in 1988. Lisa broke that record just two weeks ago, Denny, in uh, Baltimore as she went over that $82,000 mark. A record that uh, I'm glad was broken because it just shows that we're out here bowling for uh, more money, more tournaments, and have uh, more sponsors and people behind us. So uh, we are growing. And in uh, 89, we'll have 26 events, 18 telecast live on ESPN going to be a busy year in 1989. Yes, I think I'm quitting flying, so... Are you? Yes. You're going to give up the uh, probably, flight attendant? To... Probably as of January. All so right. I will be, once again, a professional bowler, full-time. 
Now you got to concentrate on this game now because as much talent as they have out here, uh, pretty tough to be working two jobs and get the job done. So uh, advancing now into the championship game is Alita Sill with a spare and a strike here. We'll shoot uh, 238. That's a nice way to open up. We've had virtually 100 entries in uh, most all our tournaments here in 1988 and tough competition. Well, what about Samstown? In a couple of weeks, I hear the uh, field's up to 170 players or thereabouts, I'm told, by Fran Wolf. Well, for a $30,000 first place check. You can bet the, those 170 players are out to get it. Possible 238 for Alita Sill, who means all business. And I guess when it's said and done, Alita Sill and Lisa Wagner battled back and forth, back and forth for the top seed position, as I mentioned in the open. Uh, Lisa winning in the position round game last night. They were only 16 pins apart, so uh, I guess rightfully so to have the two players that were 1-2 throughout the week battle for the championship here at Fairlane Southway. 238 for Alita Sill, who just seems to get turned on when she bowls on national television. She has performed well through the years under the lights. Wendy McPherson, a uh, third place finish, will be worth $2,300 this week. Of course, uh, the uh, greater Houston area really getting pumped up as well. Uh, ESPN will be. Uh, Visiting the Astrodome comes Sunday night, live and direct, as the Houston Oilers take on the Washington Redskins. Uh, Jerry Glanville's bunch trying to regroup uh, after getting beat last week, and so uh, live on ESPN this coming Sunday night, NFL action from Houston, Texas. Judy Sutar and Cindy Coburn are sitting on the sidelines uh, saying, well, Wendy didn't sh shoot 160 <laughs> at us. Uh, it never fails, never right? Never fails. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, it does change your arm swing a little bit when your opponent strikes on uh, seven, or six, rather, the first seven frames and puts them together. So uh, a very solid week, nevertheless, for Wendy McPherson. There's the handshake, and it'll be off now to the title game between Alita Sill and the player right now that's leading the money standings. Lisa Wagner, don't go away. This is a brand new... And, of course, the uh, great Southwest theme once again next week in the Little D, DeSoto, Texas, which is actually a part of the Big D in Dallas, the $40,000 Columbia 300 Classic live on ESPN beginning at 9.30 Eastern time. And then, of course, the following week, the big national pro-am at Samstown in Las Vegas. We've already talked about the big $30,000 check there. So two more weeks of live bowling, LPBT style on ESPN, coming your way. And uh, let's recap a little bit. Uh, Opening game, Judy Sutar started late and finished with a flurry, but lost 205 to 193 as Wendy McPherson started with a quick double. And once again, it was the 20-year-old right-hander in game number two against Cindy Coburn, 204 to 179. But uh, luck kind of ran out in the semifinal game because Alita Sill heated up the burners and fired the after jets and shot 238 and cruised to an easy victory over Wendy McPherson's 168. And now we're ready. Players one and players two. A right-hander and a left-hander for the championship here in the Fairlanes Open. Well, Lisa has her work cut out for her here, Denny. Alita looks uh, very strong. One thing, Alita has a great mental game, and she starts bowling well, and uh, she knows how to cash in. <laughs> Looking for the early edge as the four pin had a notion to take out the seven, but didn't. You mentioned the fact that these two players know how to bowl for the money. 34 national titles between the two of them. Lisa with 20 and Alita with 14. Both these players also came out and uh, won pretty earlier in their career. Lisa's been on tour nine years. Uh, and uh, Lita's been out on the tour for eight years. And with those that many titles and those few number of years, you know they had to win early. Well, I think both players are opportunistic. Uh, they know how to execute in the clutch, and when they do get to the championship game, they're able to step up and meet the challenge, and that's really the difference between the stars on the LPBT Tour and the players that are obviously in the top ten.
perfect shot for Lisa Wagner to open up the title game. And once again, the dominating factor here in 1988, the game that uh, is about to go over $100,000 this year, or sure trying to, and that's a $100,000 game right there. We mentioned Dave Sutar getting the opportunity to watch his wife Judy perform here this evening. Well, Kent Wagner is also bowling in Rochester. However, he is a B-squad bowler, which means he's in the process of bowling round number two in Rochester. So he's going to have to get the results frame by frame. A bucket on the left on lane 15. So maybe a little more adrenaline, a little pumped up there on the left-hand lane. Well, Lisa has not touched the lanes now for about an hour and a half, Denny, so, uh, you know, they have changed, and, um, you know, she has enough television experience, really, to know that, and she did get six practice balls earlier, so that's one thing when Lisa does make a mistake, it's usually her speed. She says, I have to keep myself slow. She throws it harder and harder, but she's one of the few female players that can throw the ball with velocity and still get it to hit in the back end. I perhaps think that that's probably her greatest asset. She's able to overcome a lot of lane conditions out here. And Alita still answering uh, Lisa with a strike and said, well, if you're not going to throw a few of them in a row, I will. Well, we'll toss a couple more numbers out. This is the 51st appearance on national television for Lisa Wagner. Meanwhile, Alita Sill has been on 45 times. Between the two of them, I think they've seen more airtime on ESPN than <gasps> the great one, Chris Berman, and also Bob Lee. <gasps> Trying to get right back at it and double up and grab the upper hand, and she does. So a classy shot in the third for Alita Sill, who really had a title stolen a couple of weeks ago. We saw her leave a seven pin here earlier on this lane in the first frame. Here, just a little bit more revolutions on the ball, and uh, she's one of, you'll see a little bit uh, more emotion. Nice smooth arm swing. There it is, creating the area on the right-hand lane. She doesn't have to throw the ball flush in the pocket to get a strike. No, it looked like she tried to let up on her speed a little bit, and uh, she did get to the, the line a little bit too early, and that was the foul line correction. And she says, thank you. She knew it wasn't the best shot she could make. Kind of waves it off. Lisa told me she's wearing her Halloween colors this evening, obviously because Kent will turn 30 on Halloween evening. Had a little problem with the approach that time. Several of the players were slipping a touch on the approach uh, prior to the start of the championship round. There you see doing a little work on the sole of that sliding shoe, and there's nothing more disconcerting than going to the line not realizing how far you're going to slide. A few of the approaches here uh, this week, we did have a little bit of a problem slipping, and if you can't stop, Denny, you lose your leverage, you get there too fast, and you, know, you just don't make a good shot. And uh, Lisa was very upset with that. She threw her towel, and here you'll see her feet. Um, she'll look down as she just keeps sliding, and she's trying not to go over the line and falls off balance and says, you know, she did mention it earlier when they were practicing, and they were supposed to have that fixed. Meanwhile, back on the championship pair, Alita's still trying to jam that pedal down and get off to a very quick lead as she leads now by nine and we're in the fourth frame that ball really just didn't drive hard enough Danny to get the seven pin out as the four pin just laid in the channel Alita's last victory on the LPPT tour came last year in the Brunswick Classic at uh, Hoffman Estates Illinois <laughs> sparing up on the cross lane conversion Look at the scoreboard here as Alita leads by nine. A little more food for thought. Uh, Alita Sill has never defeated Lisa Wagner on national television. She is 0 for 4. I don't know if Alita would even remember that. Uh, sometimes it goes through your head and sometimes you'd, you've been on for 45 times. You really don't remember who you beat and who you don't beat. Superb shot in the fifth. And uh, Lisa Wagner 
We'll try and match strikes. Lisa, look down again as she just uh, really is getting to the um, pocket. She's really getting to the line fast, Denny, as she falls off balance here. And uh, it wasn't a great shot, but she carried the wall shot, and that's uh, the rotations on the ball. Terrific performer in the clutch. A television match play record, 55 wins, 31 losses, and one tie. And she is 12 and 3 on national television in 1988. Needs a strike on the left-hand lane. No slippage there. And in the fifth and the sixth, Wagner counters with a beautiful double. That was a prime example of uh, getting it when she needed it. And this one, you can see how she stayed down, stayed with the shot, and the results were you know, superb. Through the nose, Alita Sill led by one, heading into that frame. Boy, a tough competition this week between those two players. It went right down to the position round game last night to determine who the top seed was. And Lisa wanting that top seed position once again after having a record of 3-0 and from it. We've seen her the last couple weeks in the championship round and... Uh, she hasn't fared as well as she wanted to. A second place finish and a third place finish. However, uh, she's looking for that title in the fall. Well, it's amazing. This is her uh, 14th appearance from the top seed position in her career. And she's seven and six overall. So she was below 500 before 1988 from the number one slot. That's once again, once you get on those swings, Danny. little better speed on the left-hand lane and a much better result. Yes, Alita really let up on her speed there on the sit. She needs to stay with her speed versus Lisa trying to slow her speed down. Lisa Wagner never lower than fourth at any time this week. She led rounds two, three, and four before dropping to second after five rounds and then taking over the lead very late last evening. This has been her good lane. Bad break there. The five pin got confused as it was heading south for the seven. And once again, we've seen it happen uh, three or four times thus far in the game, Denny. She's wiping her sole of her shoe. She just slipped. And uh, she's not able to get the leverage and execute properly. She doesn't get much closer. If she spares here, they'll be tied through six frames. A lot of giving and taking going on out there right now. Should Lisa win here this evening, she will then have cashed for $98,500 here in 1988. If she loses, her unofficial earnings will be $94,450 with two events yet to go to crack the $100,000 barrier. I think she'll break it. Well, if I were a betting man, and of course I'm not, I think I'd side with you. <laughs> Trying to gain the upper hand, lots of speed, and oh my goodness, you could hear that strike on lane 15 all the way back to the broadcast booth. She's just on two great shots here on lane 15, and once again, she's able to stay down and stay with it, and the results are so different than what we're seeing on lane 16, where she's sliding, the ball's not getting up to the pocket. That'll snap your neck. Look at that. The 7-9 Alita Sill cannot believe it. As soon as she let that one go, she thought it was a strike. Danny, I don't really think Alita threw this ball bad at all. I, I would obviously say that this rack had to be off here. The five pin just went right in front of the nine. Well, that was the shock of the tournament for Alita Sill and... Uh, Obviously, the break of the event for Lisa Wagner, who didn't look at the shot originally, but when she heard the crowd reaction, glanced at the 7-9 and thought, oh, my goodness, I'll take that anytime." 
Well, we did have some problems with the racks here, Denny, this week. Uh, there was a lot of re-racking going on, and Alita just may not have, you know, taken the time to really look at that rack. She had a lot of rotation on that ball, and uh, you usually know when when you deserve a 7-9 or an 8-10 for the right hand. Well, she tries to shake off the bad break and throws a good shot on lane 15, but leaves the 7, and uh, the light at the end of the tunnel is about snuffed out. Boy, she's gotten to the title match twice here in the last five weeks, or last four weeks, I should say, and uh, has bowled extremely well, but may end up on the short end of the stick. Oh, oh that's a mental error right there. Well, you might as well just hand the match. Alita shakes her head as she leaves. I just don't think she was able to recover from the 7-9 in the 8. Well, that's right. Once that something like that happens, uh, you, like you said, that was a mental error. Boy, I tell you, all that hard work all week long comes down to one shot, and uh, the shoulders drop, and you know right there that uh, she's disappointed, but I'll have to start thinking about next week in DeSoto. Back to live action, though. Lisa Wagner trying to finish things off and does not get the light hit this time on 16. Leaves the 2 4 5, so <laughs> this one's going right down to the 10th. It will go right down to the 10th. We saw Cindy Coburn miss the spare three times in her match against Wendy McPherson. However, Lisa throws the ball a lot harder and a lot straighter. And Lisa shot the bucket on this lane in the second frame, so she should have a little feel for the cross lane. Conversion chops it off, though, leaves the five, and she grimaces as she turns around. Meanwhile, Alita quickly checking the official scoreboard. Here, giving it the room, once again, trying to compensate for the conditioner in the center, pulling it across lane, and she just chops it right off, leaving only the five pin. All right, at this point in time, Lisa Wagner needs to count 20 in the 10th to win the match. That would be 197 for her elite if she strikes out would shoot 196. There you see it graphically. So time to get back to business now for Lisa Wagner. Boy, she throws the frozen rope and is fortunate to tickle the five and remove it from the rack. Denny, she almost left the 5-7 on that shot. Uh, she got that head pin off the wall that carried that five, and she just was kind of smiling there as you see her down the ball return. But well, I want to tell you, the palms are getting a little sweaty right now. You see Lisa trying to wipe them off, trying to remain calm and collected here. Convert the cross lane seven. Like she said, she usually picks up her speed. Oh, no. Well, a major turnaround. Open, open in the ninth and the tenth. Catastrophe strikes for Lisa Wagner, who shoots 186. Now, there's the possibility of a tie. Here, Lisa slips as she slips down at the lane, and she pulled the ball over, just missing the seven. Watch her look at down at her feet there. Well, like, once again, I slipped. Obviously very upset with that. Door swung wide open. Lita's got to be feeling now like she's been given new life, and she misses and throws the washout. So we'll set the scenario. If she picks this up and strikes, we have a tie at 186. Anything other than that, and Lisa Wagner's going to look to the heavens and say, thanks for the victory. I tell you what, Denny, I can't believe this match has come down to this. The Lita spares and strikes, we tie. down the stretch. Listen, the applause is there going wild back here. Can't convert it any other way than this. She slides that head pin right into the seven. to chant here at Fairlane Southway. We have tied now at 186, and you can see the expression on Alita's face. 
I tell you what, Denny, uh, she couldn't have thrown this one any better after leaving that washout. She just crunched him right here. Well, a tie in the championship, so now we'll quickly move to the ninth and 10th frame tiebreaker. Oh, my goodness. Obviously pumped up now. She strikes in the ninth. Now the pressure is back on Lisa Wagner, who is very irritated indeed with the fact that she opened in the ninth and the tenth. Not something Lisa's used to doing, Denny, and it's tough to uh, take that into consideration. for sure, and I end up with a strike. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh. She slipped once again on lane 16, didn't get the ball up to the head pin, and the bucket caved in. Wipes that uh, sliding shoe off once again. The left-hand lane has been the problem lane four sliding-wise. Let's see what happens. well here you know I don't know who was able to choose to find out who finished this match but um, I think I would have had a lead if, or excuse me have Lisa finish on lane 16 where she was really having problems I understand Lisa did choose Once again, problems with the footing. That one through the nose. But uh, what it comes down to now is the fact that Alita is going to have to at least throw a strike and then come up with eight on the second ball to win the match. Nothing like a little extended play for the championship. No, I think this is wonderful. Well, a near foul that time by Lisa Wagner as she chops and ends up with an eight count, and uh, she is really struggling on the left-hand lane. Yeah, this is really um, a shame because when you can't slide right, Denny, and for a position that she's in. Alita Seal has to strike on the first ball to stay alive. That's a little wide. She doesn't get the help that she needs. Lisa Wagner obviously very shaken indeed. It's been a rough go for her here. It's a rough go, but Lisa Wagner is the winner after uh, slipping and sliding away, as we may say. <laughs> a little <laughs> I think. disgruntled look on her face, but uh, whew, this was a rough ride for us tonight as it well. It was. I'm, I'm a little worn out <laughs> back here. Perspiration flowing in the booth as well. Bears it up, but there you see Alita. Both players really delivering in the clutch, but uh, a second place finish there. 3,500 for Alita Sill, and Lisa Wagner continues to climb towards $100,000. Well, she's won six times in 1988, but I'll guarantee you this was the toughest of the six. Presenting the trophy on the left, the vice president of uh, Fair Lanes, John Taylor. And then, of course, with a, a beautiful $7,000 check, the gentleman on the right, Mr. Jim Self, also a vice president of Fair Lanes. So Lisa Wagner had to go into extended play to win 45 to 40, but uh, she's only $1,500 away from 100000 So long, everybody. Round finals of the $40,000 Lady Fairlanes Open have been brought to you by True Value Hardware for quality, selection, and personal attention. Make True Value Hardware your store of first choice.
by Roberta Dorn. For the ultimate in cosmetics and skin care, call 1-800-678-FIRM. By Fairlanes, the fun lanes. Join a Fairlanes League today. And by Bud Light. Everything else is just a light. And next week, the LPBT Fall Tour heads to DeSoto, Texas for the championship round finals of the $40,000 Columbia 300 Classic, live on ESPN, beginning at 9.30 Eastern Time.